we have a large number of people who have uh, agreed to join us this morning and be participatory. And it's a, a great honor to be with you, uh, with IRENA, uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency. Uh, just uh, what does United States Energy Association do? It uh, convenes and it works throughout the world. We worked in 104 countries working closely with the USAID, uh, the State Department uh, and other players. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sheila. Um, now we're gonna briefly hear from Manali Zia Hazra. Manali is the Regional Energy Manager and Clean Energy Specialist for the US Agency for International Development in India. And she also um, oversees the South Asia Regional Energy Hub, which is one of our two um, uh, USAID funded bodies that are sponsoring this webinar this morning. Manali. Thank you so much, Sarah. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the United States Agency for International Development, USA, I welcome you to today's webinar on de-risking re renewable energy investments. Past one year has been difficult due to the COVID pandemic. It has affected the global economy as well as our lives and the way we work. However, there is a bright spot in these gloomy times, the renewable energy sector. It has withstood the COVID challenges. In 2020, the global renewable capacity addition broke all past records and increased by 280 gigawatt, which is 45% more than compared to 2019. The International Energy Agency expects a similar positive trend to continue in the next few years. The global RE capacity is expected to grow by 270 and 280 gigawatt in 2021 and 2022 respectively. respectively. Clearly, the investments in RV, RV sector is thriving. It is expected that 70% of investments on new generation capacity worldwide will be from renewables in 2021. The trend, however, is concentrated in few markets, such as India. Several developing economies have been affected by the pandemic and the sources of finances for new investments are constrained. Renewable projects inherently have some challenges, such as being location specific, as well as have the need for having adequate in infrastructure for its evacuation. The risk for these projects can get compounded in absence of enabling regulatory and policy frameworks, as well as because of political and credit risks. If the risks are too high, either there will be no investment or it will come at a very high cost. The webinar series has been designed to address or understand some of these issues and challenges. The webinar will uh, will provide the participants a better understanding of the risk profile for RE projects, recognize linkages between risk and financing, and identify instruments available to mitigate these risks. This webinar, the first of a series, provides an overview of the underlying risk that investors and lenders usually review and that can cause a project to fail if not addressed properly. I'd like to thank Jeff Vincent, our speaker from IRENA, who will be setting the context for this series by presenting on how risk and the perception of risk affect the, affects the bankability of project. The webinar series, as uh, Sarah mentioned, is jointly organized by two of USAID's program uh, with the United States Energy Association or USEA. These two programs are the Global Energy Utility Partnership Program, EUPP, and the South Asia Regional Energy Hub, SARE. USA is a long trusted partner of USAID on its energy program globally and spe specifically in South Asia. I'd like to thank Sheila, Sara, um, as well as my uh, colleagues from uh, the hub, uh, Pramod, Atul, Ipshita for their effort in putting these pieces together. I'm really looking forward to Jeff's presentation and I hope all the participants will find it, find it very useful. Thank you. Over to you, Sara. Thank you, Manali. All right, now we will introduce our speaker for today, uh, Mr. Jeff Vincent. Um, Jeff is a Belgian citizen. He's been working for IRENA since 2018, leading the work of the agency in the series of risk mitigation and project facilitation. The ambition of the different projects is to support renewable energy to access the support that they need. This work has now been brought together in the Climate Investment Platform, a joint initiative of UNDP, IRENA, C4ALL, with the support of the Green Climate Fund. 
Before joining IRENA, Jeff was active for nearly 30 years in credit and political risk insurance with a private insurance company and a national export credit agency in the last seven years with a multilateral insurance company. In total, he worked 20 years as a senior manager in startups in the Czech Republic, Asia, and Africa. Besides his work with IRENA, he also represents the African Development Bank and the supervisory board of Africa RE, Africa's largest reinsurance company. And he prepares the startup of an export credit agency in Mongolia for the World Bank. So as you can see, Jeff is more than qualified in this um, topic area and we couldn't be more thrilled to have him launching this short series um, to support renewable energy. Jeff, the platform is now yours. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, let me share my screen first. Yeah, I hope you see this. Um, so before I start uh, in earnest, a um, couple of qualifiers. So I've been involved in renewable energy actively uh, since 2013 when I developed at ATI, but together first with the European Investment Bank and later with KFW, two specific risk mitigation products. One is the Africa Energy, Energy Guarantee Facility, and the second one was the Regional Liquidity Support Facility, uh, which we rolled out uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So if you have any questions about that, I'm very happy to answer because I think that both have a, a lot of potential also for other parts of the world, but makes that most of my experience is related to Sub-Saharan Africa. The second qualification I would like to make is that uh, I'm told that I'm speaking reasonably fast and I'm speaking with a French accent. And as I have a lot to tell in the next 40 minutes, maybe it will be even worse than usual. I apologize for that. Um, so um, I hope you see my... Uh, my screen now, and I have a small problem navigating. One second. Yeah. So the first thing I wanted to say about uh, about risk and risk mitigation is that uh, very often the impression exists that risk is something that exists and it's objective and it's measurable, and then you can decide on how much of the risk you can squeeze out of your project. The reality is that risk essentially is very, very subjective. And it really depends on your personal position that will decide whether you think that something represents a risk or not. And um, a typical example is that uh, 70 years ago, environmental and social impact risk was neglected completely. Uh, and even today, so a developer looks at the government as a risk, the government looks at IPP as a risk because they say, well, we've been signing so many PPAs and none of them really happen. So uh, the developers are the real problem. <clears throat> and the banker will look at the developer and the risk uh, and, and, and the government both as a risk. So it, it really depends on the position you, where you're in. And I recently came across a fantastic example of that, of that um, courtesy of uh, Rest for Africa and, and PwC, who did a survey on one hand among private sector actors who are acting in the Middle East and North Africa region and the other hand with officials, uh, public service people in the, same, in the same countries. And there you see how the different risks are assessed in terms of importance. And when you look, for example, on the left, on the, the ability of financing, which is scored, which scores very high for the private sector, is completely ignored by the government officials. That means that they think that a developer has a bank behind him, has equity investors, and that finding the money to implement a given project is never a problem. And the opposite is true. And so you have a lot of different areas where you can see how big the difference in perception of the risk is according to the different roles. And that is what I want to stress. And what I will do uh, in the next 30 minutes is go through a number of causes, a number of risks, and a number of causes that, from my experience, are leading to, uh, to risks, to, to projects not being achieving financial close. 
So that is what I will first do. Then I will focus on the things that I know a little bit better than all types of risk. It's credit risk, political risk, and regulatory risk. And then I will start to talk about risk mitigation of, uh, of projects and the different tools and solutions and approaches to that. But I know that this is only one of a series of presentations. So I'm sure that my colleagues will present the next modules. We'll go more into details in, into that. So a sample of the problems that projects face and hurdles to financial close. The first one, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, can somebody from my colleagues confirm that the screen is okay? Because I'm not 100% sure of that. Yes, Jeff, go ahead. Okay, fantastic. Um, so the, the technology has appeared to be a major issue, uh, especially for the small and medium-sized projects that are developed by local uh, by local initiatives, and. Um, the, what, what I saw in, in recent cases is that at the beginning of a project, the developer looks at available technology. Uh, and again, I'm talking especially about PV uh, and, and the ideal configuration and, and, the, and the actual cost. And then he builds his financial model and all the, 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 his whole case on this, uh, on this technological aspect. And by the time that he's ready with his PPA, with his environmental social impact assessment and what have you, a uh, couple of years have gone by. And when he proposes his project to a banker, the banker will, and, and other potential equity investors, they will note that technology has changed, the prices have gone down, the efficiency of new solutions have gone up. And so the whole financial model uh, has, to be, has to be reconsidered. The technology risk is of course different with hydro, where there's always a geolog geological issue that you, uh, that you, you have to foresee. Um, and when these technological issues have to be considered, there's always a time that gets lost and time is money, as you know, and especially if there's a huge upfront cost so that, uh, that will have a bearing on the entire profitability of the, of the project. And that's why if you are a reasonably unexperienced developer, it's very, very important to be accompanied by specialists who can anticipate these problems and, uh, and handle them in, in good time. The second uh, hurdle that I have found is that if you are, have experience with renewable energy projects in one region and you want to transfer that experience to, an, to another one, you could be in for a number of shocks. Um, I have one very brutal experience with a German developer who had a very nice setup in Germany and then he came to Africa in Kenya uh, and he was working on a waste to energy project of 75 megawatt in on the biggest dump site of, uh, of Nairobi. And um, there he thought that he had a good agreement with the local municipality and with the central government. And he thought that he could go ahead without too much uh, more studies. And uh, then he realized to his surprise that the local politicians suddenly started to interfere try to get bribes uh, from the developer in order to give their support. <clears throat> he also realized that uh, the, the local population that was very positive at the beginning because they were expecting a lot of goodies from the project then suddenly turned against them and the whole project was stuck. So you really need to understand local circumstances, know, understand who is influential, how do you address them, how do you work with the communities and community representatives, uh, etc. So it's uh, very important uh, when you assess, uh, when I assess a, a project at least, to make sure that there's a realistic perspective on the side of the, the country, the, 
the province, the, the local governments and the, and the population. Um, sorry, I, sorry the, is, the, is the screen still okay? Yes, Jeff. Yeah, because I'm, yeah, I really apologize. Um, we lost the screen, yeah. You lost the screen, huh? Yes. We can see you, but not presentation. Yeah, is this okay? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, in order to, uh, to mitigate the risk that I just presented, a lot of uh, international developers look for a local partner. Local partner is then supposed to understand the laws and the regulations of the country, have good connections with the, uh, with the government and with the local representatives, and he's, uh, he's entrusted with a kind of arranging, facilitating role. The problems that I encountered there is, first of all, these local representatives very often have an own personal agenda, especially the case if you have a small the, let's say if the project was initiated by a local company that is, then is looking for an international uh, uh, company to cooperate, so he, he will try to keep the control. And secondly, uh, very often these local representatives are also to some extent politically exposed persons, and uh, there could be a, a credibility issue or there could be problems arising if after the next election, the party this person is affiliated with uh, loses the election. So it's important really to track and to, to, to double check the, the qualification, the professionalism and the reliability of the, of the local partner. The main problem that I encountered over the last years is there's a, move, there's a movement, so initially 10 years ago, most of the project, at least in sub-Saharan Africa, were single source. So there was an individual negotiation between the government and the developer, and that, that was it. Uh, after that, the, the trend that was promoted by, uh, <clears throat> uh, mostly by multilateral companies was to have a, a feed-in tariff that was agreed for the duration of the PPA. But recently, more and more, the projects are procured through a tender. That means that the developers have to compete on the tariff that they are offering in order to get the, the project uh, allocated to them. That means that they will squeeze the margins. They will sometimes take shortcuts in part of the feasibility preparation, and they will make assumptions about what the banks will accept as interest rate and what a new equity investor will accept as uh, rate of return and if these aggressive assumptions are not met by the reality the whole project can collapse and that is the major issue that I have seen with all the, the tenders of the recent years. Very aggressive pricing and then failure to achieve financial closure within the term that has been agreed with, with the government and um, so there's very very little change, uh, very little chance that, that, that some projects will eventually to financial closure. Uh, <clears throat> so most lenders will insist on 30% equity. And I see recent trends that many developers, in order to safeguard the, their rate uh, of, uh, of return, will try to squeeze it down to 25, and in some cases, even 20%. Um, small developers, then they, they will start a project, they will try to, they will acquire the land, they will do the preliminary negotiations on the PPA, and uh, at some point in time, typically they will think that they are well underway, they, they are ready to go uh, for a, a senior investor and for a bank, and then they realize too late that the bank has a completely different perception of the project, sees risks why, where the developer doesn't see them and will ask the developer then to go back to the drawing board saying, I don't like the PPA, uh, uh, the environment risk assessment and social impact assessment has not been done according to IFC standards or equated principles, et cetera, et cetera. 
And so the, the developer goes back to his drawing board, tries to fix it. And meanwhile, he's running out of money. And because the project is not mature yet, the whole project dies off. And that happens uh, far more often than one would expect. And there's a lot of money that gets lost. <clears throat> a bank, a lender normally will issue term sheets. And the term sheets usually come with what we call conditions precedent, CPs, that say, we will give you the money provided that the following conditions are met. And the list can be long and exhaustive and very painful uh, to, uh, to meet. And uh, if they are not met, if, if the bank is not satisfied with the way the conditions have been met, then they can pull off. And uh, that also happens quite a lot. Also, uh, some of the conditions that seem to be achievable at the beginning uh, change in the, in the course of the, of the project preparation. And uh, what I have seen in Sub-Saharan Africa over the last years, for example, is that initially one of the conditions is that there's a sovereign guarantee that guarantees the, the honoring of the PPA by the, by the utility. And that as the government, the, the, the national debt of quite a number of countries increases, and as sovereign guarantees uh, are part of the national debt according to the criteria of the IMF, suddenly the government decides to withdraw the, the sovereign guarantee unexpectedly. And that means that one of the CPs is not met and that the banks uh, will pull out. And I've seen that happening with small projects. I've seen that happening in one very 500 megawatt project recently uh, in, in Africa as well. Typically a business plan has to take a lot of different things into account. Uh, liquidity risk, currency exchange risk, performance risk, environmental social risk, transmission risk, logistic issues, etc., And uh, some of these risks are maybe misunderstood, underestimated, and uh, which makes that potential investors and lenders will, will not follow through. Uh, one of the big changes over the last year that I saw is that, first of all, the, the resource risk may be different due to the global warming and climate changes. And... Uh, that makes that if you think that you have covered your risk at, uh, at level of P90, means there's 90% likelihood that the resource will be available according uh, as predicted in the business and the financial plan, that uh, with the drought, uh, that P90 is not really P90 anymore. That's one thing. Uh, also on the, on the risk coverage, uh, there have been problems, and I'll come back to that later, in some parts of the world, including Southeast Asia, in the availability of risk mitigation for, uh, for natural disasters. Simply because uh, Lloyds in London, which is a conglomerate of, uh, of insurers, uh, came to the, to the evidence that they had a loss ratio of 600% specifically for PV uh, projects in Southeast Asia. And as a consequence, they withdrew their cover completely. So there are changes over time that can really affect uh, the business plan. One of the major issues that uh, a utility scale project will meet is the off-taker. Off-taker is usually a national utility. In some countries you also have um, municipalities and, and provinces, but usually it's a national utility that is supposed to pay the utility according to the PPA on time uh, for the power that it takes off. And so the cash flow of the IPP will depend on the cash flow of the utility. And many, many utilities in the world, definitely Sub-Saharan Africa, are not, do not meet the, the normal standards of creditworthiness. I, in fact, in Sub-Saharan Africa, I don't think that there's currently one single utility that would be deemed creditworthy. Kenya Power was one of them, but they run into problems and also they, they fell off. So it's not, you don't have to blame the utility for that. Usually it's because they have been forced to sell their power 
at uh, tariffs that are that don't reflect the real cost. Uh, very often there are transmission losses, there are theft. Uh, what happens in a lot of African countries is that the government doesn't want to pay its bills. And that's even more the case for the for the military and, uh, and the, the Minister of Defense. Uh, so th they're running out of cash all the time. That means that they even can't provide the proper maintenance of the grid. And definitely they have problems to pay the, the IPPs. And when a bank is aware of that, the bank will insist on having a very high debt service uh, reserve account. That means that the equity shareholder needs to put a, aside a lot of money to prove that even if the IPP, the, the IPP doesn't get paid on time by the offtake, they still can service the debt at least for six months, sometimes for 12 months. Same applies for the offtaker if, uh, if the corporate is a, has a weak balance sheet, um, especially if there's no alternative to, to sell the power uh, to the grid. Uh, corporate PPAs, they can last for a long time, but it's very, very difficult to find a guarantee or an insurance product that will cover uh, five years. So it will be very difficult to find a loan that exceeds the, the five-year tenor. And finally, if the offtake is a community, well, and there we have seen uh, a couple of uh, difficult experiences uh, with, with the COVID period is that if the com community is starved because there's, their market has collapsed, they cannot sell their fruits uh, in the capital, or whatever, so they don't have money to pay for the power. And if the, the mini grid doesn't have the money to keep and maintain uh, the service for a certain time, then uh, the whole mini grid can collapse as well. There is a problem, I'm not a specialist, but uh, when we work within, uh, within IRENA on the climate investment platform and we see hundreds of projects and we submit the, the project to technical advisors and specialists, I see quite often that the technical layoffs has, has problems that I would never imagine they exist. It has to do with the slope on which the, the PV panels have, uh, have been made, the way the, the different PV panels are connected. Uh, I mentioned with the, with the hydro, you always have geological problems. So there's a, there are technical components that will either make that the project has price overruns or that the, the technology is not able to produce the amount of power that was predicted. Um, it's a bit the same. Uh, so the technical layout is that when uh, a developer first goes to a banker or a senior investor uh, to, uh, to get additional funding to finalize his, uh, his feasibility study, uh, not everything is cast in stone yet. That gives some flexibility because then the equity investor or the, the banks can impose his own rules. But the problem is also is that the time that it takes to complete this work, uh, the, 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 the developer will run out, of, uh, out of, of cash and will have to stop. And what is also possible is that meanwhile, the tariffs at which he can sell the power will have gone down to an extent that the, the whole project is not financeable anymore. Again, I'm not a specialist in grid impact assessment, but what I know is that a uh, lot of utilities uh, work with an obsolete infrastructure that is not really well prepared to handle what they call intermittency. So the fact that the power will not be uh, fed into the grid at a constant rate, but really depends on the amount of sunshine and the amount of rain. And uh, that, that makes that uh, even if there's a substation that is installed, the, the, the transmission line is not able to, ha to handle this new type of energy. Um, and so the grid assessment is essential. A grid assessment, as far as I know, is not really cheap. So that has to be completed before you can go to financial closure. <clears throat> I already mentioned the resource assessment, that is the availability of wind, the availability of sun, 
uh, the availability of water. Uh, and ideally, that should be assessed and more or less guaranteed at a probability of 90 or 95 percent, while a lot of uh, junior developers look at 50 percent. But it's also you also need to keep keep into account the in, the potential impact of climate change. You also have to take into account the way that the resource was measured. Uh, if you have uh, a wind uh, turbine at a height of 150 meters, measuring the wind on the ground is not enough. Measuring the wind at 100 meters high is not enough. So you need really to measure the wind against the blade, as I say. And that has to be done over quite long periods. For wind, I think that uh, typically they're asking for uh, measurements over a period of three years. And with that, again, the investor may run out of time if he didn't do his homework in, in time. Uh, there are among investors and, uh, and banks very often big concerns about the quality and the integrity of the EPC contract, especially if the EPC contractor is also part of the equity, <coughs> participates in equity, and thus the developer doesn't have another choice than to take uh, this EPC contractor for, for, the, for the product. And ap apparently 30 to 50% of IPPs face technical and problems related to the, <coughs> to the EPC work. The other issue, and that's my second bullet, uh, is that the contractor who already has a problem will be very ag aggressive to find the cash that he needs to survive and therefore will provide very low bits for his part of the work in new projects. Uh, we have seen it's not only on the development of the IPP itself, but it's also on the transmission line. And uh, I have a personal painful experience with Lake Turkana in Kenya. It was a 300 uh, megawatt wind farm where the transmission line of 420 kilometers had to be constructed. And the, the contract was given to a Spanish contractor who ran into trouble very quickly, went bankrupt. And as a result, the, the construction of the transmission line suffered delays, I think, between two and three years. And it was a very costly experience for the government of Kenya because they had given a take or pay um, uh, clause in the PPA for in case the construction line was not uh, ready in time. Uh, transport, surprisingly, can be an issue. If you set up uh, a wind farm in a windy place and there's no road to that windy place, you have to realize that you have to to carry these turbines, or usually over roads, that means that you have to uh, you have to construct the road. That means you have to make sure that there are not too many bumps in the roads, because otherwise uh, the equipment can can be damaged. Or you have to make sure that the turbines are small enough so that you can transport the different components by helicopter. Uh, you have that. You also have the the import. It's very good to know that the government has given you uh, uh, tax uh, relief on the import of the components for the transport, but the authorities at the, at the port of entry may not have that understanding and you can lose a tremendous lot of time uh, just negotiating your way through that situation. So logistics have to be planned carefully. I was quite naive until five years ago about environmental and social impact assessment. So in my view, naively, I thought, well, it's a matter of counting the butterflies and, and, and the wildflowers and uh, making a deal with the local community. It's far, far more complex than that. And I've seen big problems and big uh, projects. I'm thinking about Kinangop again, 100 megawatt wind farm in Kenya that has stopped completely <coughs> because of uh, social impact assessment. The reality is that the local population, when you go to them and say, we want to set up a wind farm, we want to set up uh, a dam here, and you will be compensated for the loss, they have no idea what's coming to, the, to their land. And uh, they, they may agree to a certain type of 
uh, of compensation. When they see the reality, what it really means for them and for the community, they can change their mind completely and the whole project may run into deep trouble. Um, two examples of Kinango, uh, Kenya. So there was an agreement with the communities, everything went well, the project achieved financial closure. Then some local politicians came aware of the project. First thing they did was buying the land on which the transmission line was supposed to be constructed. And the developer then had no other choice. And then they asked ridiculous price for, for, for the way leaf. So the, the developer had no other option than to make a zig, to develop a zigzag uh, transmission line that would avoid these problems. Next, the developers, they turned to the local communities and said, well, these wind turbines, they will make your cow sick. You will be sick. You will die from it. It makes radiations up to 100 uh, 10 kilometers uh, outside the, the zone of, uh, of the power plants. And, you, and that created so much animosity and riots and then people died in it. And eventually the whole problem was put to a halt. Uh, same with Lake Turkana. Uh, for, for Lake Turkana, again in Kenya, so a big road uh, had to be con uh, constructed. Uh, to, um, to carry all, all the equipment and the turbines. But with that road came a, a lot of other problems, so a lot of transport, the trucks came in, the, the whole local economy changed. Some people gained and some people lost. Um, also, the local community expected jobs, but the only jobs or herders that could be given was uh, Ascari, so uh, doing security and entry control at the camp, etc. Well, the better jobs, of course, they went to qualified people. These qualified people, they had a lot of money and they created a local inflation, local economy so that the local population got worse off. And that created, of course, a lot of animosity and that had to be care, uh, managed very, very carefully. <clears throat> so that's the social impact, so I, uh, I skipped this slide. Uh, and as I mentioned, if the developer is not aware and is not experienced in the management of these problems, they can run out of hand very quickly. Uh, nowadays, the rule is that each community that could be involved has to be engaged, that the developer has a local office with reliable and credit uh, and, and good representatives of these communities, that there's a permanent dialogue on the daily, weekly basis to make sure that any issue is well understood and addressed in good time before it runs out of hand. <clears throat> then the, the PPA. PPA is, a, is a, one of the key contracts, the power purchase agreements, and it regulates nearly all the parts of the, of the power supply, including the, the price. What you see is that with the technology that is going, that's become cheaper and cheaper and is improving all the time, governments are tempted to postpone the signature of the PPA, hoping that, the, that they can negotiate a, a, a better price. Uh, sometimes also the PPA signature gets delayed because the banks comes in uh, before it gets signed and then is unhappy. Typically unhappiness uh, from the bank and senior investors on the PPA is on the termination clauses, uh, on litigation clauses, do you go for other arbitration, do you go for arbitration in London with ICC or do you go for local arbitration? It has to do with the currency of the PPA and the way uh, the currency risk will be, will, will be handled. And uh, so this, and again, the, the risk is that the project runs out of time and, uh, and that nothing happens in the end. The other thing that you have to be aware of is that the governments, they also look at what's happening in the region. And if they see that in Zambia, uh, uh, following the tender, the government has achieved uh, a feed-in tariff of $4.00 per kilowatt hour, whereas the feed-in tariff, uh, one country further, is still at $8.00. Well, obviously, there will be a lot of political pressure for the government to cancel the PPA if it's not too late, or then to say, well, we have signed the PPA, but uh, it's still, uh, we still need, you still need one signature. I will not give that signature unless you 
agree to, to revisit at, uh, the tariff that we have agreed. <clears throat> Yeah, so, and that's uh, just, I, I just summarized that. So there are so many areas where the PPAs can be renegotiated and uh, there's always a risk that the, the, some agree, pre-agreed features will be challenged. Um, on the procurement side, so as I mentioned, you can have uh, single sourcing, you can have uh, feed-in tariffs, you can have tenders. Uh, I see more and more international developers who refuse to step in uh, projects where there was no international tender, simply because there's always a risk that if there's a change of government, the next government will say, oh, but this was flawed. Uh, we could have gotten a better deal. We don't accept this PPA. And uh, then the, that problems get stuck in one way or another. So uh, that is something you have to be aware of, that uh, non not going through an, an auction is, is, has become quite risky nowadays. And then finally, I think many countries can get away with unilateral changes in the, in the PPA or in some other contractual commitments once. It means that the reputation of the country is definitely at risk whenever it goes to the market uh, in uh, a second time. So there's a they say the, the most uh, strong example for me comes on in South Africa, where South Africa started with auctions for renewable energy that went very well. And so you had the first wave, second wave, third wave. On the fourth wave, uh, there was a social impact <laughs> event that made meaning that the unions who realized that about 100,000 people in South Africa are depending on coal uh, for their income, uh, they realized that if the, the trend continued to go for renewable energy, then a lot of these jobs were at risk. And they started to lobby the government to stop uh, this auctioning process. And as a result, there were significant delays. And whereas South Africa was on the way of achieving a fantastic reputation in the auctioning of renewable energy and was copied also in many other countries, suddenly, uh, they have a blow and a lot of supply chain disappeared and a lot of international investors have become very cautious uh, before they invest in, in, uh, in the country. Finally, it's not only about negotiations with P or the PPA and with Minister of uh, Energy, Minister of Finance. There's a lot of other problems legally that can appear. In many countries, for example, land rights are not really predictable. And it happens very often that when an investor has in good faith bought a land, suddenly you have three other parties that, that show up with the land title and say, this is mine and you can't do this. Uh, the number of permits, licenses that have to be achieved, I think in Zambia is 34. So it's very, very difficult to ensure that there's complete comp consistency, both in the contents of the permits, but also in the sequence in which these different permits uh, and licenses can be acquired. So it's very important to understand if there are gaps, where the gaps are, and make sure that you have enough confidence that the eventual gaps uh, are, uh, uh, can be met in a, in a way that is acceptable. Um, last one, I think, the tariff. If the tariff is too high, uh, the government will be tempted to reduce the tariff. If the tariff is too low, uh, it's the bankers and the investors who will be unhappy. So you need to find the balance that makes sure as a developer that you can service your debt, that you can make your investor happy and that the, and that the politicians and, and the utilities are happy as well. Um, yeah, finally, uh, most, some of you will be aware of the, the way <laughs> the country risk is assessed. So uh, the most, there are lots of different ratios, but the most popular one is the OECD uh, country rating. If the country risk overall is too high, and that has to do with the, the political stability, risk of terrorist attacks, the sustainability of national debt, and so many other things, if the country risk is too high, and downgrades can happen very, very quickly, and the, ten, the trend 
from S&P, Moody's, Fitch over the last years is really, there's a more tendency to downgrade of country risk rather than upgrade simply because the, the national debt increases, you have the impact of COVID pandemic on uh, developing countries. That makes that some guarantees and some sources of funding may become un unavailable. <clears throat> um, I'm not at the end, apparently. Uh, sorry, um, can somebody from the moderation tell me how much time I have left? Because I may, may have to rush a bit. Um, but if uh, you can go on for another 10 minutes. Fantastic. That's all I need. Thank you very much. Uh, supply and demand. So many countries are fairly good at managing the supply, attracting investments by giving good tariffs to create a, by creating an enabling legal environment. Many countries are not so good at anticipating the demand for power. Uh, one typical example is uh, Uganda, where and, and even Kenya, where the idea was well. When we extend the grid and we make the energy affordable to, to more people, the demand will increase automatically, automatically and will meet the, the additional supply that, that we are providing. The reality is that if you are in a very poor uh, uh, area, uh, whenever a, a household is connected to the grid, you will see that they will install two light bulbs and that's it. They don't have the money to buy a fridge, they don't have the money to buy a TV, and definitely they don't have to, the money to purchase the equipment that allows them to do what they do, productive use, welding, sewing, uh, whatever. Uh, and that makes that the utility, if they have agreed on take and pay uh, uh, PPAs, they have to pay for power that they cannot sell off to the to their customers. It makes that the the treasury of the uh, of the utility can deteriorate very very quickly. Um, same for uh, for the mini grids when they serve a specific uh, community. Uh, a lot of mini grids in sub-Saharan Africa have gone bust simply because they were expecting too high consumption. And what they didn't realize, and I think that awareness is now more generalized, but five years ago was different, is that in order to increase the consumption of power according to the business plan, you also have to create an ecosystem that allows the community to increase their consumption by developing the productive use. That means that you need to, you should be able to provide loans to the carpenters who want to uh, buy the new machines. And if that doesn't happen, everything remains stuck to the two light bulbs that I just mentioned. Um, support of the Minister of Finance remains very, very important. And as I mentioned, the trend in Sub-Saharan Africa at least is to withdraw the sovereign guarantees. And in some cases they are replaced by, let's say a weak alternative, which can be called letter of comfort, letter of support, and uh, if that letter is not legally binding, considering a number of experiences so the last years, banks will be more and more reluctant to, uh, uh, to accept these. So the only solution is in fact to substitute the government risk by a risk of a multilateral entity that has a preferred creditor status and that then guarantees more or less on behalf of the government that obligations will be met. Otherwise, the multilateral that can be a multilateral bank can be a multilateral insurer uh, will step in and, and find a solution in one way or another. So just to conclude, there are many, many risks. And that is also what makes the energy sector unique compared to all the other risks that you, you can face uh, in, the, in the economy. Many different risks. And, a developer, an investor, a bank has to face these risks, become aware of them, try to assess them, and then make a decision. The decision is either to accept the risk because it's not that big, to reduce the risk uh, in one way or another, to run away from the risk or to transfer the risk. Running away, that means uh, giving it to, to, to the developer rather than to, to the bank. 
um, or transfer the risk to a third party that is able and willing uh, to take that risk, like a guarantor or, uh, or an insurance. Now, very quickly, the main risks, I think I mentioned the credit risks, off-taker risk, corporate off-taker, uh, and multiple small off-takers typical for, for a mini grid. So there are, that is a key concern for most developers, most banks. Political risk is in fact, the term political risk means a lot of different things. It means expropriation, nationalization. Uh, you think it's your power plant, well, I'm me, government, and saying it's mine now. But it can also be what we call creeping expropriation by just not, by withdrawing a license. You have currency in convertibility, so I'm paid in Ethiopian beer and I want to transfer them into US dollars and there are no US dollars available. Or I have US dollars on my bank account, but I cannot transfer that money outside the country. And that's typically what happens in, uh, in Zimbabwe. Or it is a non-honoring of sovereign obligation. Sovereign obligation can be uh, a guarantee of a payment guarantee, but can also be the obligation to construct the transmission line, for example, or to construct a road that leads to the development site. <clears throat> then you have the non-honoring of sub-sovereign obligation typically will be off-taker risk, uh, will also be in, in the case of, uh, uh, in the countries where the, the national utility, utility has been split into a distribution company, transmission company, and a generation company, uh, can be that one of these three does not uh, meet its obligation. Unfair calling of bonds is where uh, the developer or the EPC contractor had to issue a performance bond and the bond was called without good reason. And finally, you have arbitration award default, which is a strange thing. So it means that whenever one of the previous events happens, the insurer or the guarantor or the multilateral will ask the developer first to go into arbitration. Um, arbitration then has to come to uh, a verdict, an award. If the award is in favor of the project, then usually it's the government that has to provide the compensation that is foreseen in the award. If the government refuses to pay the award, then you have a default. And only then will the insurer, the guarantor, uh, compensate the, the, the project for the loss. The problem is that the whole arbitration process usually takes between three and five years. And by then the project will have gone bankrupt and there's no beneficiary anymore. Regulatory risk is the risk. The, the problem that you have with energy is that the risks the funding covers a period of 20 to 25 years, PPA typically 25 years. That means that every now and then there will be a new government, every now and then there will be a new person in charge of uh, this contract and who will be tempted to challenge saying, well, we have, we've been paying far too much uh, or we don't need this uh, anymore. And uh, we, the government needs income. So the tax exemptions will not apply from now on. Etc. So there's a lot of regulatory risks that are basically very, very difficult to insure unless through a sovereign guarantee that says, well, if we, we government, if we will impose taxes that are not foreseen right now, we will give you a, comp a financial compensation. Um, but uh, it, it is a, a big, big concern for, for many developers. The other trend is that uh, because of the oversupply and, uh, and the lower demand, there are, there's a lot of pressure for the utility and the government not to pay for power that cannot be sold down uh, to the end user. And there's a lot of pressure to accept changes in the PPAs. And then if you figure out as, a, as an independent power producer that you still can make money if you accept the conditions, then you will be tempted to say, I cannot go to my insurer because the arbitration award default is such an expensive and, and long process and uh, it will prevent me from doing business with other countries in the continent. So there's a, a, there will be a lot of pressure to accept the new conditions that are imposed by the government. Um, as I mentioned, the, the national sector development planning 
is is always tricky uh, because there are a lot of political agendas very often which region do you favor where do you expand the grid uh, how fast can you uh, transform the infrastructures in a way that it can accept uh, renewable intermittent renewable energy and uh, as a consequence there's lack of confidence from the especially from the lenders going with the project or there's a significant increase of the risk premium and I will skip the risk the rest um, two minutes if you promote if you allow me um, yeah, yes. yeah yeah yes please. So, <laughs> thank you so renewable energy is unique for all the reasons that I mentioned far more difficult to understand when you go to a, a regular insurance company and you say I want to insure this or this risk on my renewable energy project, most of them will say no because they, they don't understand the risk. It really requires a, a certain expertise and there are not so many players who have that expertise and on top of that have the capacity and the risk appetite to take, uh, to take all these risks. Uh, and de-risking is critical because in the end, when you look at the cost of capital nowadays for a Western bank, uh, it's close to zero. That means when and again, Sub-Saharan Africa, a bank typically will ask for an interest rate of 12 to 13 percent, and sometimes more. Uh, so the difference between the cost of funding and the interest rate that, that they are ask represents the, the risk premium, the compensation that they ask because they are asked to, to spend money on a project that at some point in time can turn back. And there, the big difference between fossil fuel energy and renewable energy is in the structure of the costs of both uh, types of uh, enterprises. In the case of uh, fossil fuel energy, you have a reasonably small initial investment to set up your factory, but then for 20, 30, 40 years, you have to buy your coal, you have to buy your gas and your fuel, and that is a running cost. In the case of renewable energy, your resource is free, it's wind, it's water, it's sun, but your initial investment, your capex is much, much higher. That means that you have to pay your interest and pay your dividends on a much higher amount. And if the cost of that capital is higher, suddenly you will see that you are not competitive anymore compared to, uh, to fossil fuel uh, energy generation. And that's why it's critical to bring that risk. And the risk can be perceived, the perceived risk can be real, the risk has to be brought down to a level that renewable energy becomes uh, competitive again. And for that reason, you need uh, insurance, you need guarantee products. Um, and again, there are not that many available because hard to understand, very difficult to compare. For a developer, he usually he thinks about MEGA. Uh, in Southeast Asia, he may think about the Asian Development Bank that has some people. Uh, partial risk guarantees, but he needs to be aware of the different products that exist, uh, of the, the different features of the product, because a guarantee is not the same as an insurance product. Uh, and also it comes at a certain cost that makes some developers swallow. So it's, uh, it, it's a tricky one. And I think that the next webinars will focus on that. The only thing that I last slide probably is that you can reduce the risks at different levels. Ideally, a lot of them can be taken away at institutional level by, for the, by the country, by improving its legal and regulatory framework, by making the utilities credit worthy, etc. Once you have done that, you have to look at the contractual risk, the PPAs and, and all the other licenses and all the other agreements between uh, the transmission uh, line supplier, the, the, the utility, the, 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 the Minister of Finance, etc. And we have a number of standard solutions. IRENA developed uh, open solar contracts together with the Terawatt Initiative. Scaling Solar is a product from IFC. Get Fit is a product of uh, KFW. And you, you may have other solutions where the, there's a, an attempt to create standard contracts that allocate the risks in an okay way for, for all parties. And then finally, when you still have residual risk, then you have to look for either to swallow it or to look for uh, alternative uh, uh, guarantee and insurance products. Yeah, 
and I'll stop here. Thank you very, very much for your attention. I hope I was clear. And uh, now I'm going back to uh, the moderators. Thank you, Jeff, for your informative presentation. Uh, there are a few questions from the audience and we have uh, put them on a slide deck. Uh, we'll project it for you. Yes, please. So, um, yeah, so let me leave, emphasize on risk mitigation on lending to micro and small enterprises on renewable energy technologies and applications in livelihood and small businesses and their mitigation best practices, especially on coming out of debt cycle. Um, I'm not sure that I understand the question correctly, but what, what I have seen is that in many countries, uh, the lending has to be done by the local banks. And local banks in many countries, in Asia, in Africa, they only have one rule for lending. And it's named, I want a collateral. And the collateral has to be 100%, 150%, or 200%. That means that the household or the micro enterprise has to provide tangible assets that the bank can seize if the, if the loan is not serviced properly. And most of these households don't have that. And it uh, requires a different skill set and a different mindset for local banks to move on from pure collateral lending to another kind of lending where don't, they don't have that comfort um, of uh, having the opportunity to, to claw back on, the asset, on these assets. Um, are there solutions? There are a number in the making. Um, there is uh, one in the making in Africa that is uh, spearheaded by Greenmax. Uh, there's one that is spearheaded by the Caribbean Development Fund uh, to cover Caribbean countries, where in fact the idea is we give, we guarantee to the bank that 50% or even more of the non-performing loan will be paid by that facility, and that facility is then usually uh, supported by donors. So, and, and donors <clears throat> in, in this area could typically be KFW, Agence Française de Développement, could be USAID. So th there are a number of donors who are willing to, uh, to help to, to move out of this deadlock. Um, the problem with these solutions is that you need to find a balance between <clears throat> giving enough comfort to the bank and reducing the bureaucracy that comes uh, with it. Because of course, a donor wants to be sure that the money that he's spending on such a facility is used properly. And those who will impose checks and controls and balances where the bank at the end says, well, you know, it's just too much work for not enough money for us. We just skip it. Uh, but, uh, and I'm involved in quite a number of these, uh, these products, so that is, uh, the only way forward that I uh, have found so far. I hope this answers the question. A lender will always insist that the local partner is a shareholder, my experience and uh, is willing to bear in principle 30% of the total capex. That means that as they say the man with the idea says I have a fantastic site in mind, but I don't have the money to buy it. Uh, I, I'm, for, I'm sure that uh, uh, we will have a, a great PPA. The man with the idea I think has no future. That is uh, my conclusion after many, many attempts to provide some support to small, uh, small developers who uh, are usually deeply involved in the local community. Uh, I think it's, it's an uphill battle. So if you don't have money or you're not able to attract money uh, at an early stage, it's unlikely that you will find it. You can challenge me.
Um, sorry, I have to read this a second time of Take Utilities. Um, Jeff, what we can do, yeah, maybe yeah. we can respond to this question later on in writing. Yeah, because I'm not really sure that yeah. I understand the question correctly. Yeah, yeah no problem. Uh, so, so that's... Uh... If this project sponsor wants to transfer 100% share of the SPV of the COD, well, I think normally uh, there's very often a condition precedent that the that this project sponsor has to stay in the project for at least two years of the COD, or RE, yeah. Um, and of course, he will only be able to transfer the shares if the bank accepts <coughs> the alternative uh, uh, shareholder that is proposed, very, very clear. Exit strategies, yes, there are, well, refinancing is also, also always an issue. And uh, I think there are, there's one big untapped market and I know there are a lot of attempts to address it, uh, to, uh, to, to bring in institutional investors, asset managers, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, who don't like the initial development risk, who don't like the, the construction risk, but once the, the project is operating, generates profit, they're happy with a smaller profit margin. And as a consequence, it, the, you have a natural fit there with developers who do who take all the initial risk and then get their premium at the moment that they see the project to, uh, to these institutional investors. And you have a number of, uh, let's say, blended finance institutions like Infraco that really have integrated that into their business model. That was the last question, Jeff. Sorry? So this was the last question. So Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Great. Well. Thank you. Thank you so much for your informative presentation and speaking continuously for close to an hour. On behalf of the uh, organizing team, I express our gratitude to you for taking out time today and uh, helping our audience to and us also to better understand the different types of risks that are involved in renewable projects. And uh, where there are risks, there are opportunities too. So you briefly touched upon few solutions for de-risking uh, renewable investments. And in the next webinar in this series, we'll cover those solutions in details. So our request to audience will be to watch out for the announcement. Today we had uh, more than uh, 250 registrations from uh, 40 plus countries across all six continents. So I'm thankful to all our participants uh, for taking their time today and uh, also for asking the questions. The recording will be made available to everyone. I extend our um, appreciation to USAID uh, for guiding the preparation of this webinar. Thank you, Manali. I also thank uh, Sheila Hollis from USCA for her opening remarks. Uh, this webinar was jointly or organized by two programs of USAID, the Energy Utility Partnership Program, EUPP, and uh, South Asia Regional Energy Hub. So I thank uh, Sarah Blanford from the EUPP program and my colleagues uh, Atul and uh, Ichita from the South Asia Regional Energy Hub for their contribution uh, in organizing this uh, webinar. So with these words, uh, we move to the end of today's webinar. I hope everyone liked it and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.